Yes. Okay, great. Take it away. Uh, so today I'm going to present on the Santa Monica proper hotel. Uh, my name is Robert Chattel. I'm a historic architect and principal of Chattel Incorporated. We're historic preservation consultants located in Los Angeles. Uh, this project um, has been a, a long haul for us uh, and we're very excited about it. Uh, it involves adaptive reuse of the building on the screen, the Santa Monica professional building constructed in 1928 and designed by master architect Arthur Harvey. One of the things that you should notice in this photograph is that the podium level at the second floor uh, has uh, a number of uh, plants and trees in it. It was originally a green roof, uh, didn't last for very long, um, but is uh, an important part of uh, Harvey's work. Uh, so, uh, again, another photograph from the 1930s on the left, and then uh, just as we were starting construction in 2016 uh, on the right. Uh, so the, the building um, is one of the more prominent uh, historic resources in Santa Monica, uh, and it reflects a, a city coming of age in the 1920s. Uh, the image on the screen uh, currently shows uh, uh, what a view to the east would have looked like in the 1930s when the uh, Santa Monica Pro Professional Building was first constructed in a principally residential neighborhood. Uh, the project involved rehabilitation of the historic landmark building and construction of, uh, new, uh, uh, of a new addition. Um, the buildings only connect at the uh, second floor with a, a small bridge, um, which if you can see my cursor, I'm pointing out right now. Uh, one of the important aspects of the design collaboration with Howard Lax architect, who was the design architect for the project, uh, was to reflect the shape and form of the historic building in the new construction. So uh, Y-shaped above the first floor, the tower of the landmark building, uh, has sort of faceted uh, corners um, and uh, tower elements, which you'll see more of. The new construction uh, uh, smoothed out those facets with curves. So there's a lot of bent glass, uh, exposed concrete. Uh, the podium level of the historic building is reflected in a podium uh, on the new construction. This is a photograph of the project under construction. Uh, the rehabilitation of the historic building uh, to the left uh, is uh, well underway uh, with the uh, scaffolding on the building, as you can see. Uh, again, the uh, new construction is all poured in place, concrete with some elements of uh, cast stone uh, uh, GFRC that looks like concrete. Uh, I mentioned that the road to rehabilitation here was a long one, um, and we were involved starting in 2005. The City of Santa Monica's Landmarks Commission uh, previously had uh, a list of potential landmarks that they wanted to see designated, uh, a priority list, and uh, they brought forward on their own uh, interest uh, designation uh, that occurred in 2005. The building is recognized uh, generally for its Chirigoresque architecture, uh, uh, and um, that's fairly unique in Santa Monica. In 2009, we formed a group to start studying a hotel project on the site. Uh, the principal developer at the time was the property owner, Alex Gorby, who's shown in the center of the photograph on the right. Uh, uh, he started acquiring the site in the 1970s. Um, uh, in 2012, the city certified a final environmental impact report. Um, the uh, EIR contained a number of mitigation measures, uh, some of which addressed historic resources impacts of the project, uh, which were generally found to be less than significant. But the 
mitigation measures addressed vibration monitoring, construction monitoring, and training. And I'll try and cover um, some of those topics. Um, this is a large project in Santa Monica, and it's covered under development agreement uh, that the property owner entered into with the city council in 2012. Um, I think that the image on the lower right is kind of funny. There's a, uh, some uh, plaques on the building that describe that there's a development agreement. Um, there are a number of public benefits provided by the project, historic preservation being one of those. We extensively use the California Historical Building Code, uh, and I'll try and cover some of those topics. Under the development agreement, which relaxes uh, some of the city's development standards, uh, we used a joint design review body to review the project. It was subject to review under local ordinances by both the Landmarks Commission and the Architectural Review Board. And instead of um, having uh, those two groups meet separately, um, there was a JDRB, a joint design review body, created with four Landmarks Commissioners and three ARB members. And they met several times uh, from 2014 to 2017. Construction occurred between 2016 and 2019, and the hotel opened in June of last year. So the training video. Uh, we did a training video to comply with one of the mitigation measures. Uh, it was uh, um, subtitled in uh, Spanish, and it involved myself, uh, structural engineer David Koch of Structural Focus, who was the structural engineer for the historic building, uh, and John Griswold, who was the project's uh, building materials conservator. So uh, construction workers had to watch this video uh, before they uh, started work on the site. And it, it addressed concerns about how to uh, treat uh, historic materials. Uh, one of the larger issues uh, in this project was seismic retrofit. It's a reinforced concrete frame and reinforced concrete uh, exterior envelope building. Um, it had suffered a significant amount of damage in the 1994 Northridge earthquake. The image on the upper left is an exterior wall that I'll show from the outside in a minute. Uh, there was a, a building uh, adjacent uh, that um, uh, when there was ground shaking uh, caused significant damage between the two buildings. We did a significant amount of uh, seismic retrofit. Here you can see uh, the um, epoxy grout injection in the exterior perimeter walls. Um, this is that east wall where there was an, a building, an unreinforced masonry building uh, that um, when there was ground shaking, we didn't know until we demolished that building just how much damage had been caused. Um, but it's quite obvious here, and this was our, our repair. Um, most of the seismic retrofit uh, work is uh, through those traditional means that I described. Um, uh, epoxy grout injection. We added some shear walls on the first floor, which impacted the lobby. Uh, and uh, we used uh, an approach of uh, fiber reinforced uh, polymer. Uh, FRP uh, to strengthen the exterior perimeter walls, some columns, some beams, and even some floors. Uh, again, the, the Y-shaped tower made it a particularly difficult building to retrofit, and the structural engineer did not want to add significant weight or mass to the building, so we avoided adding uh, shear walls on the upper floors. Um, we only used the FRP. Um, for those of you, you who are familiar with this product, it's a netting of sorts that's uh, 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 wedded to the historic uh, building by first abrasively blasting the concrete surfaces and then adhering this product that goes up somewhat like wallpaper. And this is the first time I had ever seen it uh, during installation. Um, uh, we used the provisions of the California Historical Building Code that provide for a reduction in the lateral force resisting elements. Uh, this is a part of the interior of the building. Uh, the city of Santa Monica does not generally designate interiors. 
Um, and in this case, the interior was not designated. You can see in the image on the left, the before and on the right, the after. Um, one of the key interior elements of the building was the marble floor in the lobby, but that's all that was left of the historic finishes and a central stair that above the first floor is oval in shape. Um, and one of the key elements that we sought to preserve was that stair, uh, even though it wasn't identified as uh, part of the landmark designation. Uh, so the marble floor was one of the areas that required significant intervention. We preserved about a third of the original lobby floor. The other two thirds was removed in order to accommodate the footings uh, for new shear walls. Uh, and then the finishes were reconstructed. Um, I mentioned the historic stair. This is the oval shaped cast iron stair uh, in the building. Uh, it's hung from the floor structure above. If you could see my cursor, there are um, some small steel straps that held it in place historically. Uh, it was suspended. Uh, the walls uh, of the stair were hollow clay tile. You can see them uh, under demolition in the image on the right. The stair also had a number of elaborately shaped arches uh, that were originally open to the corridor. Uh, again, the interior was not designated and this was only subject to local review. Uh, and we were able to demolish all of these walls and we ultimately reconstructed them. Um, we filed before we filed for the building permit, we filed for an appeal uh, using the California Historical Building Code to keep this stair. It doesn't comply with code in a wide variety of ways, uh, in particular how the, the door uh, opens to the corridor. So we sought to preserve its character by reconstructing elements uh, in including the elaborately arched uh, openings. Uh, and the image on the left shows uh, the template being made for the gypsum plaster um, uh, uh, reconstruction of that archway. Uh, part of the uh, successful appeal was to have a door still enclosing the egress stair, um, but it opens out into the corridor instead of into the path of travel. When it opened into the path of travel, it blocked exiting uh, uh, users uh, from the floors above. Um, in order to uh, have that uh, historic stair remain, part of the equivalency was that we provided a, a code compliant exit stair. So we removed uh, uh, elements of the floor system and we created a new stair. Um, all of the exterior windows are still intact in that new stair. Um, the building's original second means of egress was a fire escape and we removed the ladders from that fire escape. And that was really because it was a transient use proposed for the building. Um, when the Santa Monica Professional Building first opened, it uh, uh, served both um, medical offices and attorney offices. And uh, this is an image of the southernmost bay on the 7th Street side of the building. It was an ambulance bay, so it was a driveway of sorts. Uh, it had cast stone elements, this pierced screen and the cartouche above. Uh, this has now been converted into an outdoor dining terrace uh, for the restaurant on the first floor, Onda. Uh, so the secondary elevation was opened up uh, with uh, new uh, um, passageways um, and to uh, create a dialogue between the historic uh, landmark building and the adjacent new construction. Um, one of the uh, challenges uh, for us, especially during construction monitoring, uh, was how we treated the historic steel sash windows in the tower. Um, it turns out that the windows were um, particularly flimsy and not watertight. We did water tests and they simply uh, leaked. Uh, so in the image on the right, you can see that we've installed a stainless steel sill, uh, which allowed for uh, us to direct water back out of the building 
they also did not meet the sound transmittance coefficient, the STC rating that we sought to achieve for the building, which was 36. So we devised a system of adding uh, new quiet windows. The quiet windows are sliders, they're aluminum. They're inset into the uh, uh, window frame, uh, not generally visible from the exterior. Uh, it's a little awkward how they open. And I think if we all had our druthers, we would have replaced these windows. Uh, but this was one of our commitments early on was to preserve and rehabilitate the windows. We uh, installed new limiters, uh, which limit the ability to open the casement windows to four inches. And you can see in the image on the right, the stainless steel sill and the, the new sliders. Um, on the first floor podium, uh, we used the historic documentation uh, that we were able to find, including historic drawings, to rehabilitate the storefronts. All of the uh, wood sash transoms were intact. Um, the vast majority of the storefronts, including most of the recessed openings, had been previously altered. The corner window is particularly important given the, the curvaceous character, if you will, of the new construction. Um, we thought it was particularly important to return the uh, corner storefront opening to uh, its original bent glass. Um, and we had plenty of evidence of that in the concrete bulkhead. This was the only concrete bulkhead uh, that was preserved in situ in place in the building. It was underpinned. Um, they had no foundations under the bulkhead. Uh, you can see that the, the bulkhead itself was curved and that uh, straight glass was added at some point. But there's plenty of documentation to uh, allow us to return uh, to the bent glass. Um, uh, under uh, John Griswold's direction, we ended up keeping the uh, multi-layers of paint on the Ashlar uh, waste mold concrete of the building. Uh, there were cast stone elements, as I've noted earlier with the pierced screen. There were finials. The finials were generally pinned in place with um, stainless steel uh, helix anchors. And we uh, duplicated the finish where we needed to repair sills, uh, frames around windows and so forth. Uh, but we determined early on, uh, particularly through thermal photography, that the building uh, was not holding water and that the layers of paint uh, were well adhered. So we left them intact. Um, the tower elements uh, were one of the sort of key features that were restored. Uh, they too had steel sash windows. Um, we uh, decided that we were going to uh, replicate the original um, uh, pierced grills, and this is uh, in the image on the right, you can see a template uh, for that. Um, we also uh, uh, reconstructed finials that were missing. So from the original drawings, we were able to recreate uh, a rather tall uh, finial on these tower elements. Uh, these were all done, the gypsum plaster, and uh, uh, GFRC and Portland cement plaster elements were all uh, manufactured by Moonlight Molds. Um, there's a plaster uh, a mold on the left and then the finished product on the right. Uh, we used uh, stainless steel all thread to attach these elements. So you can see from the historic documentation to uh, what we had um, that had been altered over time to the final product in these images. Um, I, I mentioned the uh, pierced grills here. Um, there's a complicated window washing system now required by code, uh, which uh, requires that there be a bar installed uh, to hold a window washer. Um, the uh, pierced grills are fabricated of fiberglass. Uh, they just look like stone from the street. Uh, and somebody can uh, climb out that window uh, and uh, repel down the building. Um, and this is what it looks like at night. The towers are lit. You can see in the upper right image uh, how that's lit from the inside at night. Uh, it's really quite a, a remarkable achievement, I think. Uh, in fact, all of the lighting 
Uh, and uh, I just think this is a great project to see uh, an office building that was for many years a Class C office building uh, converted into a hotel um, with new construction that, that just barely touches it. So uh, um, that concludes my presentation. Thanks so much, Robert. <laughs> so I think we're all set. Uh, are you ready, uh, Dick? There you go. And then uh, Robert, you can go ahead and stop sharing your screen so that Dick can share his. And if anyone has any uh, questions that you want to ask uh, Robert, thanks Robert for that great presentation. It's remarkable uh, what you've been able to do with that building. You can go ahead and post your questions in the Q&A and also uh, chat if you want. Uh, you ready, Dick? I uh, certainly am. Uh, okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Dick G. I'm an architect and project manager with uh, Spectra Company. And um, Spectra Company is a uh, construction company and we just specialize in historic construction. 90% uh, of what we do, over 90% of what we do is all historic rehabilitation. Um, and um, I think adaptive reuse is a perfect topic for us because uh, our, our tagline is respect, restore, and revitalize. It's, it's really trying to re adapt communities and revitalize uh, them. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today is the uh, Earth Cafe. So uh, the Earth Cafe is located in Orange, California, and, um, and it was an adaptive reuse from an office building uh, and retail building into a, uh, a cafe and restaurant. And uh, Earth Cafe, it was, a, it, was a, it was a great team to work with. Uh, Earth Cafe was founded by uh, two uh, owners a husband and wife team of Shalom and Gila Berkman. And uh, they were really on the forefront of uh, organic growth coffee and teas. And so their company, uh, uh, just their, their, their whole um, feeling and, and motto is just really sustainability. And, and several, they, they have locations all around uh, LA and um, Tokyo, Dubai, different locations. Uh, but, but many of them are in historic buildings. Many of them are in adaptive reuse buildings. Uh, so this was a great fit. Uh, we also work with an architecture firm that is uh, specialized in restaurants, uh, SF Jones uh, Architects. Uh, they were the architects for all of Wolfgang Puck's restaurants, Spago and, and, and many other uh, uh, um, Southern California eateries. And so, uh, they, so they were great uh, uh, restaurant designers, but this is one of the first uh, historic buildings they had done, as well as they teamed with uh, Spectra Company as the uh, uh, general contractor. Um, and so just to give you a little bit of context, um, if you haven't been to Orange, California, I suggest you go there. Orange is a, is a great, wonderful community, and it has a lot of, uh, uh, of, of um, there's a, a large historic district there, uh, has a, a, a great commercial uh, corridor with historic buildings. So in 1982, uh, the first historic building or her historic district was established, which is the Plaza National Register Historic District. And that's the area in, that's bounded in uh, uh, red on the map. And, um, and that was the first historic district that comprised of the um, the Central Plaza uh, with the, uh, the Central Plaza has a fountain there. That's the, the center of town. Um, and, and with all the commercial buildings around that compose of restaurants, retail banks, there's a theater there, there's uh, antique stores. Uh, and so uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, historic uh, community there. So that was established. But you can also see uh, all of the orange are contributing historic uh, buildings to the district. So, so there was a lot of residential around there. Uh, Chapman University is located in that area. So, uh, so another historic district was established, which is the Old Town Orange National Register Historic District. And that's the entire area that you see, but uh, you can see how many uh, contributing historic uh, re resources are there. So that's the context of where we're at. Um, and we're right at the center of that. So right uh, at the plaza area where you see the star is the Earth Cafe. So it's located right on the plaza. Um, and so, um, so the, the Orange has a history of adaptive reuse. And, and there's a, a number of uh, structures there that were previously adaptively reused. 
Uh, you can see some successful ones, the, the train depot that was uh, uh, converted to a diner. Um, that's an example. Uh, a rich, Richfield uh, gas station that was also converted to a, a restaurant, the filling station. That's a, another example there. Um, here's an example of uh, an, an 1886 uh, um, constructed Violin Hotel, which uh, was converted to Wahoo Tacos. Um, I didn't know we could go from uh, a hotel to tacos, but uh, that's a great adaptive reuse uh, there. And this is uh, technically, I, I don't know if this is more of an evolution than adaptive reuse, but uh, uh, Watson's uh, um, drugstore, which was uh, built in the late 1800s, uh, you can see on the left, it, it slowly, I, I guess it was adapted over uh, many years, uh, it slowly became more of a soda fountain, more of a restaurant, and now is completely a uh, soda fountain and cafe. Uh, but that's been in operation since the 1800s. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of con context to the community, a rich history of adaptive reuse. And so it was a natural location for um, Earth Cafe to go into and adaptively re reuse their, their own building. So. Uh, a little bit of the building history here. So um, uh, our building was uh, built in uh, 1988. It was a, um, a wonderful little uh, Italian uh, uh, revival uh, building. And uh, so it was originally built uh, for the Hemphill and Morris uh, Real Estate Investment Company. And, um, and here you see uh, the photos that were circa 1906. So it was originally constructed as a smaller one-story building uh, brick. Uh, you can see some of the, uh, um, the, the, the cast iron uh, columns and the, the capitals there and uh, the uh, stone insets uh, and the, the, uh, the bulkhead there. So uh, wonderful little details here, but uh, uh, that was the, the original building. And so it had an alteration, a significant alteration in 1907. So so you see on the right, uh, they, they went ahead and added a second story as well as they built, uh, uh, they enlarged the building to the, uh, the west. So that was over, over twice the footprint to the, the, the west. Uh, you can see on that bottom left, that circled in red, that's the, um, that's the extension uh, towards the west uh, that had the, um, the glass storefront. So, so, uh, so it was altered significantly early in its history. And so that's, that's uh, really the uh, building as it was originally constructed. And so we came onto the project in uh, late 2015. Um, and so this is the existing uh, conditions of the building. So, um, so by the time that uh, uh, 2015, uh, the storefronts were, were completely lost. They had been ripped out and reconstructed um, and, uh, and the building was covered in plaster. Uh, so it, um, it was uh, significantly altered. Um, you can see even the uh, divided light windows. I, apparently they had a design standard that every tenant got to pick their own size window and, and, and so on. So even that was a, a pretty um, eclectic uh, organization of windows there. So, so that's, where we, that's where we started the project. The interiors were, uh, as with many um, offices and retail, uh, buildings. Uh, they had been altered through many years. So in, interiors were just whatever the, uh, the, the retail store or the office uh, had, had remodeled it to be. So uh, everything on the interior had been, had been lost. So that was the uh, condition we um, uh, took on the building and, and began it with. And so um, I think what I wanted to do today was just uh, uh, just categorize a few things uh, in terms of adaptive reuse and, and how we, what's, what is successful adaptive reuse. And so uh, one of the, I mean, the definition of adaptive reuse is to take something that's, uh, that's existing and to, uh, to change that and make it, uh, you know, make it uh, workable for the use. Uh, but I think one of the things that's, that we don't appreciate as well is taking the new use and adapting it to what the uh, original building was. And so a lot of, the, a lot of times uh, we have discovery, which is discovering interesting things about the building that gets reincorporated into the design. And I think one of the, so one of the credits that I wanna credit um, 
the owners with is they were very flexible that uh, they weren't they weren't sold on the, the design details as they began the project but as we discovered things as we uh, figured them out uh, they they adapted the design to to meet the the original uh, historic building and so one of the things that was uh, the intent was to restore the storefronts but um, the key to success was what if there were any details left because uh, uh, recreating the cast stone or cast iron columns would have been a very difficult task. And so one of the things we did was we exposed the, the original construction and uh, luckily we did find the original uh, cast iron uh, columns buried into the, uh, the existing storefronts. Uh, at some point they had cut off all the column capitals um, and so, so it was altered, but, uh, but at least there was something to build off of and to uh, and so we were confident that uh, in terms of the design that we could re, um, re uh, restore the original storefronts and so uh, so all, although all the the capitals were gone um, there was a, a flattened version of the capitals in in terms of these pilasters which is uh, on this right side so that was the only thing that was remaining and so um, so here's an example here of uh, taking the uh, taking what was remaining, and and we uh, uh, on the left there uh, took the uh, a, a mold of that pilaster, and one of our artisans then uh, took the, took those pieces and recreated uh, the original uh, pilasters to uh, or column capitals to uh, match the the photographs. Bottom right, you have a uh, um, some testing of different uh, finishes and and so on. So. On the upper right, you see the final restored uh, column capital there, and so um, so taking finding the the cap uh, the columns there and incorporating it, them back in the design. The other thing is that in the historic photograph, we could not tell what uh, this threshold was at the bottom of the building, but uh, as we we exposed some of the original construction, we found that it was actually a cast iron uh, threshold towards the right there, and so. Um, so we were able to find that, but uh, but as we exposed more construction, we realized that that much of it had been cut off. So the only the, the only part of it that remained is the area circled in red. And so um, so what we were able to do there was we we cast a mold of it, and you can see even in our mold we can see, you can see the original writing of Baker Ironworks. And so um, so we cast a mold of it and. Um, and uh, recreate that out of out of resin and um, and just uh, patina it to look like the uh, the original. So uh, in the photograph on the bottom, um, you can see the to the left. This is the original um, cast iron threshold, and uh, to the right is the uh, the recreation to to match that to to make it look similar. Um, so uh, another wonderful find is is that. Um, you know, originally, as, as I mentioned, it was really a small one-story building. As we exposed some of the walls, we found that there was the original, there was remnants of the original uh, sign from Hemphill and Morris uh, in, the, in the structure. And so, um, so we called the owners and, and they changed their design to incorporate that uh, into the, the project. So, um, so again, that what we found is on the left, uh, to the right is the finished one. Uh, we use the technique called infill painting and, and, uh, and, and really restored the, uh, the, the sign without uh, changing the character of it. Um, and so, uh, so that's, that's always wonderful to find uh, different things in the building that you, uh, that you reincorporate. And again, adapting the style of their, uh, their new cafe uh, and incorporating the original, uh, the, the original character of the building. So uh, here's another exa example. I commonly, uh, this happens a lot, is, is finding the original transoms uh, buried in construction. Um, so uh, we did find the transoms here. And what's, what's interesting here is, 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 is not just discovery, uh, but what I'm just going to call false discovery. Because at that center one in the middle, uh, there were a number of transoms um, in the building, and so um, so the design was already um, reviewed and approved uh, by the local uh, design review uh, board, which is also incorporates uh, historic review. And so, um, 
but it was always interesting that the spacing looked uh, very odd to us. And so uh, as, we, as we uncovered it and looked more closely, uh, even though this looks like an, uh, an older original transom in the, in the bottom, it, it was a replacement and, and the storefronts had been changed over time. So, you know, this is over a hundred years. So, so there was uh, um, um, a, a, a change that, uh, uh, that was made and, uh, the, and the, the whole look and, and feel of the, the, the storefronts were, were changed. So, um, so what we realized is that to restore it to the, the, the original, uh, we took the original uh, storefront and, and uh, used that and, 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 um, and, and really changed the spacing. So, so it, and it took a, an effort on the owner's part because uh, it, they realized that we, we've got to go back to the historic commission, back to design review, take more time. Uh, but to their credit again, uh, they wanted to do it right and to make sure that we had the correct uh, um, the, the correct storefront we can restore uh, per the photographs. And so um, another thing I want to talk about here is, is adapting to the new, new use is that, um, you know, a lot of times we get into uh, adaptive reuse and, and there's, there's definitely a lot of limitations because of, of, of preservation, but sometimes we don't uh, we don't realize that there could be more effort made to, to adapting uh, the, the building to the new use. And so, um, so he, th these are a few common things that we find in, in uh, adaptive reuse projects. Obviously, in terms of structural, I think we're all uh, familiar with shear walls. Uh, it's an unreinforced uh, masonry building and it does require shear walls. And so there were only a, there's only one interior wall in the, in the whole building. And, um, and there's, um, and two of the facades are, are um, open storefronts. So, so there's not too much opportunity for shear walls. Uh, you can see on the left here, uh, there's a section of brick wall that we need to put a shear wall in. But I think one of the things that's, uh, that I appreciate is, is really trying to retain the character because the Secretary of Interior Standards could have easily um, allowed for the structure, uh, the shear wall to take place and then and drywalled over that. But, um, but the owners and, and us, we wanted to um, reclad it within, within kind brick uh, just to, to try to replicate the original wall that's behind it. So we, uh, we, we went ahead and reclad it. And so, uh, so that's the, uh, the original, or that's the uh, shear wall uh, right behind the stair in the, in the photograph there. So, uh, so that's shear walls. A lot of times there's also the, uh, the need for moment frames. And so, um, so again, we're, we're trying to open back up the storefront. And so one of the things that, that the, the infill uh, um, uh, really acted as is, is, is basically shoring for the whole building. Um, I, I know there's a lot of stru structural engineers on the call today, and, and uh, I'm sure you can appreciate the fact that um, uh, and an unreinforced second story over a open soft story facade is probably not a good thing. So, um, you know, basically incorporating a moment frame behind the soft uh, uh, front or first story is, uh, is something that we needed to do. And so here you can see um, it aligning with the, the post behind it and trying to recreate that openness uh, of the storefront. Um, and so, um, and another uh, thing that, uh, in terms of a new use, is that uh, the, the they really wanted an open two-story volume space to give that that grand feel of um, of walking into the cafe. And so, um, so the, the the steel frame was used to also um, create a, an opening to allow the, the the masonry wall to extend two stories. Uh, and open up that space. So that's the uh, that's in the the entry and the um, the, the coffee area there. So um, and one of my favorite parts of this is just basically um, um, the operable windows. So uh, the one of the things the owners really wanted was um, an open storefront where they could uh, have patio seating. They can open the restaurant. Uh, we were trying to create the recreate the storefront windows, the the, the picture windows, and so um, they had come to us and said, you know, we had talked to another contractor and they said that it can't be done; it's too large of a window. 
um, our salesman said, yeah, we can do it. And, uh, and so I was handed that project to figure out, uh, I don't, I said, well, you realize that these are almost 12 feet wide and seven feet tall. Um, and by the time you account for wind load, uh, these are, um, these are 500 pound windows. And so, uh, if you put a counterweight on it, you're hanging a thousand pounds off the, uh, the, the floor system. So, uh, so, uh, but anyway, we tackled that, uh, we couldn't do it out of wood because it, it would have racked the, uh, it, it couldn't handle the racking of the windows. So, so we, we had to go with a lightweight aluminum. And, uh, but we did clad it with uh, wood to recreate the wood, um, um, try to make that, that, uh, the, the in-kind appearance. And so one of our challenges then was to uh, hang it uh, off of a pulley system and, and, these, uh, and, and into the floor framing. And so, and so I thought it'd be cool to do a, a, a bar weights. Uh, so, um, and so we uh, did the counterweights out of these uh, bars um, and, and stack them and, and match the weight of, of the window. So uh, one of the great uh, feats is that we were able to get, um, uh, we just happened to pull uh, um, one of the waitresses there and just, uh, and just have her test it. And so uh, it's great to know that any employee can open it, um, um, just uh, one person it takes to open a, a, a 500 pound window. So, uh, so that was a, a great, great opportunity, but I think uh, a lot of times we can look at this and, and see that uh, these are challenges that the owner wants to put into their new use that, um, that may challenge us, but, uh, but I think this is a win-win for preservation compatibility and, um, and, and the new use. And so uh, again, appreciating adapting things for the new use. Uh, finally, there's a, a, the case for tradition. And again, since all of the interiors are lost, um, you know, we could easily, anybody could easily come in with a more contemporary um, um, interior improvement. But I think one of the things I appreciate is the, the desire to have uh, nice traditional details into the project. And so, uh, so here, here you see some of the interior. Um, uh, the owners found a fountain in, in, on one of their trips to Italy and they wanted to recreate that. And so, uh, so that, fountain is a, is a match to that. Every, all the tile here was handmade and custom made by a, a local artisan. Um, and um, you can see the uh, coffee bar incorporated some of the stone insets in, into the wood that mimic the uh, bulkheads on the exterior. So again, um, they didn't have to be uh, incorporate traditional details, but they wanted it to, to allow it to be more compatible. Uh, Here's the, uh, a little bit of the dining area as you see the, uh, um, the operable picture windows uh, incorporating the wood, uh, wood and glass dividers uh, of, of the dining room. Uh, here's more of the interior dining um, interior uh, and hand hewn um, copper um, uh, fireplace ex uh, exhaust uh, hood uh, there and um, and there were different metal elements that were incorporated, that were found in the building that were reincorporated into the design as well. Um, you can see the uh, hand painted um, Earth Cafe sign that mimics the, uh, or just has that same feel as the original Hemphill uh, um, sign there. Again, just a lot of the little details, uh, handmade, uh, these are hand, hand custom hand crafted uh, tile on the stair. Uh, the stair also had uh, handmade uh, orange uh, details, so uh, since they're in Orange County. Um, on the right, you can see how they've uh, incorporated column nets to, um, to really be compatible with the cast iron uh, stone columns. So again, I, I think one thing I, that's not appreciated is, is uh, you know, how much traditional um, details can be compatible uh, be more compatible with the historic architecture. And, and, and I think you can feel, uh, you can see that, you can feel that um, this feels like this, this, uh, this uh, uh, restaurant belongs in this building. And this building uh, feels like it has a, a, a restaurant with these types of details. So just to recap, here's, uh, here's uh, the original uh, historic photo. Um, you know, the way we found it in the restored um, entryway, um, you know, the before and after the plaster covered uh, building and now, you know, the uh, original restored building there. And, uh, 
And there you have it. That's the uh, that's the Earth Cafe project. It's a great adaptive reuse. And and one of the uh, one of the ones that I uh, I work on a lot of historic buildings, but I get to go there a lot because I, I love eating there. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Yeah, thank you. That was a great presentation. <laughs> to, someday we'll get back and be able to get a cup of coffee there. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. it. I know that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, Chris, would you like me to take the first question? Or I would. Or, okay, <laughs> I'll do that then. Um, so, really, there were a, there were a lot of questions that came in. So maybe I'll take these methodically in the uh, order that we received them uh, somewhat. And so. Naturally, a lot of these questions will start with uh, Robert Chattel. So Robert, there were a lot of questions about the, uh, the life cycle, the polymers and other materials that you use. Uh, William wanted to know, do those chemicals break down over time? Do you have issues with them long term? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I'm sorry, I don't know enough about the long term uh, uh, degradation of the chemicals. I can tell you with the FRP in particular, it off gases and also requires fire protection. So all of those surfaces were encased in uh, new uh, Portland cement uh, plaster, including the floor areas that received the FRP. I got this one, John. So uh, Craig is a follow-up. <laughs> I said John's laughing. Uh, so Robert, were there any historic proportions, windows, datums, other that were used on the new building? Um, yes, the, first of all, the, the new construction has uh, uh, a high volume first floor that mimics the exact datum of the podium of the landmark building. In fact, the bridge connection is at the same uh, elevation. Uh, it, uh, the site uh, drops off to the south. So um, in the first floor of the new construction where the hotel lobby uh, restaurants, ballroom are all located. It's a particularly tall volume. Um, with respect to the windows, the pattern of windows that are both uh, poured in place concrete and uh, cast stone, if you will, uh, GFRC, uh, all of those proportions are intended to mimic the vertical uh, steel sash casement windows in terms of proportion. Um, there's no, no window is exactly the same size, but it's intended to mimic that I, I should add that the uh, uh, JDRB, the Joint Design Review Body, was keen on making sure that the new construction would be a good uh, standalone building on its own, that it shouldn't be, you know, that the secretary standards call for it to be subordinate, but they wanted to make sure that it was a good building on its own. So it had to have its own architectural merit. And I'll, I'll follow that with a question that follows on, on your comment just now for both of you, actually. Um, there was a question from Karen, and she's asking, uh, she, she, first of all, she says an amazing project, Robert. So congratulations on your excellent work on that. But um, she was saying it was really fun to see all these before and after photos. But she wanted to know what was the pushback on the open stair, if anything. And usually when we talk about pushback, it sometimes comes down to the committees and commission, uh, commissions that are involved in the decision making process. And I'm wondering um, if each of you could talk a little bit about um, the differences between Orange and uh, Santa Monica and how those kinds of decisions are made and uh, your thoughts on that process. Um, I'm happy to go first, Dick. Uh, so in Santa Monica, again, we had a joint design review body. Uh, interiors are not subject to review, um, either under architectural review board uh, rules or landmarks commission rules unless the interior has been identified. Uh, no feature of the interior of uh, the Santa Monica Professional Building was identified as significant. Uh, uh, that said, that, that's the starting point. So there wasn't regulation of that. However, um, uh, we wanted very much to keep that historic stair. We would have lost, there are 55 guest rooms in the historic building. We would have lost two rooms per floor. Uh, uh, a, a 10 rooms uh, reduction if we had to remove the historic oval shaped stair and create a code compliant stair in that's basically that same space. Um, so we applied, before we applied for a building permit, we filed an appeal application, uh, which the building official uh, considered. We worked with a 
fire protection engineer, um, uh, a John, John Young husband. Uh, and we, we first tried to get the stair open uh, to the corridor as it was historically. No slam door, no window, uh, nothing wide open to the corridor. We were adding a second new code compliance stair. So that seemed, uh, and adding a full fire automatic sprinkler system, uh, which is what the California Historical Building Code calls for. Um, uh, that uh, request for appeal summarily failed. The building officials said, no, no, and no, we don't like any of it. Um, so we came back with a compromise position to use firelight um, glazing system, a fire resistive glass uh, in the a corridor window, and to have the slam door uh, again open to the corridor, opening the opposite way of the egress path of travel. Um, we ultimately chose not to put the firelight uh, glass in because of the mullion system. We thought that it would be too cumbersome. So that was our solution. We were granted the appeal before we applied for a building permit because we would have had to have changed the entire design of uh, at least the historic portion of the project if we had not been successful in the appeal. Uh, I'll share a little bit about uh, in the city of Orange. Uh, City of Orange is really unique in that um, because so much of the city is in the historic district, um, their uh, architectural review board, uh, their historic review, they're all one, one body and, 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 and all of the staff is well versed in, in, um, in historic rehabilitation. Uh, we worked a lot with uh, Marissa Mosier, which actually used to work at Chattelink. Um, and so, um, so I think there was a really great uh, public a private partnership in the sense that as we were working on the building, um, as things would come up, um, they were very, very quick to respond. So uh, one, one great opportunity too is it, this is one of the few buildings where uh, we're a block away from the building department. So, so it's it, so it's great to even have an issue come up that day. We walk down, we talk it over with them, and then we get a resolution that day. So that was that was great. But but in terms of the um, uh, I, I really enjoyed working with the uh, the design review uh, um, commission there because um, uh, again I, they're all well versed in historic rehabilitation. They understand the language, and they uh, they're very thoughtful in their decisions. So so it, it was a great uh, great process there. Okay, I was gonna um, I'll go back to you, Dick, and then. To you, Robert, how was it uh, working with the with the clients? So, Dick, you had mentioned that you've seen a lot of historic buildings. I know you have too, Robert. So, how did you find that this experience maybe differed from others uh, in a in a good way? Yeah, I think um, the, the the success and 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 definitely the enjoyment of a project has a lot to do with your clients. And and in this case of Earth Cafe, um, especially you know, it's different when somebody's not vested into the, the, the rehabilitation, they just want to get the new use and that's, that's it. But with a, with a restaurant, you, they are vested into this. And, and Earth Cafe more than others, because uh, Gila Berkman, the wife, is a, um, she's, she's a very integral in the design. And so she actually, um, she actually um, went, you know, they, in their trips to Italy, she went and researched different stones, different tiles, um, they had worked with this artist, Tyler Arson, uh, many times in the past. So, so a lot of that was actually her her design in terms of the type of tile and, and so on. So, so it was great to work with with them. Um, and as we discovered things, we'd bring them up and we we collaborate and figure out well how are we going to how are we going to incorporate this and 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 make the decision yeah we're gonna spend more money to uh to modify this design and, and we did that several times so so i think at no point did we get a pushback that hey we have to change this to try to incorporate uh this some of these historic details or character into it um so it was a it, it was a great process um i and um and i think i think it's always a, a great uh, thing to have good collaboration where uh, where uh, you can you have uh, somebody that's knowledgeable in preservation to present the facts, somebody who loves preservation to understand them and make those decisions. So, 
and I'll say our project was a different scale. Uh, and it was a joint venture partnership of Alex Gorby, the uh, property owner who started assembling the site in the 1970s, and Brad Corzin of the Core Group, which is a large Los Angeles-based uh, property owner developer that uh, does a lot of historic building rehabilitation. Um, uh, uh, Brad is one of the principals of the Proper Hotel Group. Uh, um, uh, Brad's wife is Kelly Worsler, who's the uh, interior designer. Um, for all of their projects. So there was, uh, I think, also a collaboration going on, uh, particularly with the interiors. But uh, this, uh, our, our project was, uh, you know, uh, by comparison, quite, quite large. Gold, Goldman Sachs is the principal investor um, in the project, and it just requires very little change during construction um, to keep things on track. So, um, you know, I think that we were generally successful in doing that. That's, that's great. I think we need to wrap it up. So I did post uh, both of your websites into our chat box. Uh, Robert, is there any other way that people can get in touch with uh, Chattel? Do you have an Instagram or a Facebook or anything? Uh, we do. Um, we're on Instagram. So I encourage you to look at at Chattel Preservation. Great. And then how about you, Dick? Um, yeah, we're on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And um, I'm not the social media person, so I don't know all of those answers. <laughs> I'm sure people can find you. Um, we have, wait, we have one last question. How, oh, I don't know if we can take this one, John. How would you proceed if oh. discovery added costs? I'm, I'm going to usurp your uh, question <laughs> and ask another one from Facebook because I thought it was really interesting. Okay, uh, I guess we have a, a couple more questions, guys. I thought we were done, but we have a couple more. <laughs> yeah, and we can ask the, the, the question from Judy as soon as I finish this one because I want to make sure the Facebook people um, excuse me um, I wanted to make sure the Facebook people uh, had a chance to ask questions and then there was a comment from Elizabeth and she said sure hope we can adaptively reuse office buildings for housing particularly for affordable and low-income housing in my honest opinion we need to curb overdevelopment at least in Santa Monica I'm a longtime Santa Monica resident living in a historic district in an apartment building designed by Edith Norman, the first woman registered as an architect in Los Angeles. So I don't know if our panelists had anything to say about the tie between adaptive reuse and housing and how we can, as historic preservationists, push for more housing. Well, I'm, I'm happy to comment. We do a lot of adaptive reuse projects in Los Angeles. Adaptive reuse is actually a term of art in the city of Los Angeles. We have an adaptive reuse ordinance from, I believe it's 1997, which has really changed the face of downtown Los Angeles. Tens of thousands of apartment units have, and condominiums have been constructed in uh, commercial and industrial buildings. A very successful ordinance, which relaxes uh, many of the code requirements uh, for adaptively reusing an existing building. The principal one of which is to not require any additional parking. Um, so no parking is required uh, other than what uh, parking may have already been in a building. And at the same time, that ordinance requires that there be seismic retrofit. So it's been very successful to serve as a model ordinance uh, throughout the state. Okay, uh, Chris, you have the opportunity to take the final question. I'll give it to you. <laughs> okay, well, we just now we keep getting more questions, but anyway, I will we'll close up with this one from Judy. How would you proceed if discovery added costs not available? I'm not even sure what that means, but I'm sure you two do. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm taking the time to absorb that, question, <laughs> but uh, but I assume it was it was for me. But um, yeah, I, th I think that. Uh, um, Well, I, this, well, discovery, uh, obviously there are times where it adds a lot to the cost. Uh, I think most, most discovery, I think when you're talking about in this context, um, it, it, really, um, it, 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 it really guides what's, what's there rather than add, to, add that much to the cost. Uh, um, like for example, the, 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 um, the, the transoms, you know, were, we were going to restore those anyway, but it was more and more of an accurate way of, of doing it. Um, I, I guess, I guess the ones that you did add to the cost is the mural and, uh, you know, just, just things like that. So, um, so I, I think there's, there's, 
in every in every construction project, there's always a, a trade off in terms of uh, costs and value, and that is a sensitive thing to talk to clients. You know, we were fortunate on on this this uh, project because they they it was above their original budget, but they 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 were they at the end of the day they were happy and satisfied with it, and they could support it. Um, I think sometimes um, sometimes discovery. Uh, we have to um, defer things, you know, where we may find a, a mural and we maybe we can't restore it now, but we make sure it's preserved and maybe that, that it's deferred to another time. I've seen projects where that has happened. So we don't lose, we don't lose something, but we just know that it's going to be happening another day. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it depends on the project and, and, and what's found, but, um, uh, but it's it's all in the overall thing because sometimes you put more money into incorporating discovery and, and you take money out somewhere else and, and you have to make it work that way. That's great. Um, I think we should uh, wrap it up now. John, you're going to post the information about the survey. Oh, uh, yes, I will. So first, uh, before everybody leaves, I'm posting a link in the chat box to take a survey for today's program. When you take that survey, it's gonna say, uh, take you to a thank you page after you complete it, and that'll put you on our main website, which allows you to register for tomorrow's design award programs, which we encourage you to do. We should have close to 500 people uh, tomorrow for the design awards, and we have a People's Choice Award. I think we mentioned that earlier, so we want you to pick your favorite project from the list of the 18 projects selected this year for the design awards. Um, thank you okay. to both of our uh, panelists today. We really appreciate your time I'm sure I can speak for everybody here to, uh, in saying that your projects were very impressive and we all enjoyed learning more about them. So enjoy the rest of your days, everybody. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. See you soon.